Hey guys, welcome to the American Museum of Natural History's Reptiles and Amphibians Live. We have a really cool show lined up for you today. We're going to give you a great kind of behind the scenes tour of the Department of Herpetology, and we're going to show you some great specimens. Um, one of our research scientists is going to talk about her work that she does in the department. We're going to show you some of the live animals we've been sheltering in place with. And at the end, we're going to answer all your questions about reptiles and amphibians. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get started. Uh, my name is Lauren Vanami, and I'm one of the collection staff in the Department of Herpetology. Um, you may not know what herpetology is, so I'm gonna tell you, it's the study of reptiles and amphibians. So frogs, snakes, turtles, lizards, salamanders, crocodiles, and maybe some things you've never even heard of before like Sicilians or amphisbanids. And the, the collection is really awesome. So a lot of people don't realize that a big part of the museum is actually behind the scenes in collection spaces. And all the, you know, mammalogy has mammals, and ornithology has birds, and we have all of the reptiles and amphibians. And the collection is really like a big dead animal library. So this is a great shot of me actually in our turtle collection. Um, so scientists from all over the world come and utilize our research collections. And we have almost half a million specimens in herpetology alone. So that's 500,000 dead reptiles and amphibians that scientists use to study. And I like to think of the collection as a library. And just like you would go to the library and pick out a book and check it out and bring it home and read it, and return it when you're done, scientists do the same thing with our specimens. They'll call me and ask to borrow a dead reptile or amphibian for them to do their research on. They check it out just like the book, they do their work and they send it back to me when they're done and I put it back into the collection. Um, and collections are really important. A lot of people don't realize just how cool the collections can be. All the way from looking at just like the world's fauna, getting a giant uh, library of the fauna, looking at environmental, environmental contaminants, health and safety, climate change. You can utilize the collections to answer all these types of questions, um, which is really cool. So I'm gonna show you some of my favorite specimens. So there are three types of specimens in the collection, the way we prepare them. There are fluid specimens, dry specimens, and clear and stained specimens. So I'm gonna show you some cool examples of each and why the scientists use them. So first up is fluid specimens. Almost the entire collection is preserved in alcohol. Um, alcohol, it, um, it preserves the animals and you can keep them forever. So I have specimens that were collected over a hundred years ago that are preserved in alcohol and they still look perfectly brand new. It's really cool. So this is an awesome specimen. If you can tell what this is, this is a rattlesnake that tried to swallow a horny toad and choked on it and died. I love this specimen because if you look closely, you can actually see the horny toad exploding out of the rattlesnake's throat. It's really gross, but I think it's super cool. And we preserved it like this. Um, and so the horny toad is actually a, a type of lizard. Um, and that's why it has these like backward facing spikes on its head. So when this rattlesnake tried to swallow it, it couldn't. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, another specimen we have of fluid, this is, this is a really cool specimen as well. So my background is actually sea turtle biology and my specialty is to cut open dead sea turtles and see why they died. Um, and this is actually from the inside of a sea turtle. This is the inside of a leatherback sea turtle's esophagus. And you can see it's covered with all these, these spikes. These are actually kind of sharp spikes. And what it does is these spikes face downward inside the, the turtle's throat. And because they, they eat underwater, when they open their mouth underwater, the water pressure will almost vacuum out um, what's ever in their throat. So they have these downward facing spikes to keep the food inside their esophagus and keep pushing it down while they eat. Um, so this is a really cool specimen because you might not often see the inside of something dead, but I, I like it. And scientists really like to use, they prefer to use fluid specimens because it's nice to have a whole body of a specimen you can look at. So if you want to look at color patterns, if you want to look at their skin, if you want to CT scan them and see their inside, you have a whole body you can work with. And the majority of our collection is preserved in alcohol. Alcohol. And it's all these massive just jars and tanks and buckets and barrels of fluid specimens that are preserved. Our second preparation type are, are dried uh, specimens. So this can include skeletons, dried skins, taxidermy, shells, and my personal favorite, mummies. But I'm going to show you some turtle, uh, can we go with turtle shells? Okay, so these are really cool. So here's, um, 
here's some turtle shells. The cool thing about these turtle shells, these are um, geometric tortoises, and these guys were collected in 1810. So people often ask me what the oldest specimen in the collection is, and this is one of them. So these specimens were collected almost 200 years, or almost 200 years ago, which is crazy. Um, so 1810, oldest specimens in collection. Um, and this is a, an example of a dry preparation type. It's a shell. So someone who wants to study like turtle shells or anatomy would use a specimen like this. Um, oftentimes scientists work with skeletons when they want to work specifically with bones. Um, we actually had someone come and measure our, our frog uh, arm bones, looking to see if frogs were right-handed or left-handed, which was really kind of crazy. Um, so the, most people work with the bones. Um, we get a lot of paleontologists as well that try to look at uh, bones from modern things to try to figure out what they found from that's you know extinct at this point. Um, but my favorite dry specimen are the mummies. We have a few mummies, but this one is my favorite. So this is a 4,000 year old mummified gecko. And I just love his story. So back in, um, way back in the thirties, the Metropolitan Museum was unwrapping a mummy that they excavated from a tomb in Egypt. And they, this is before like modern CT scanning and stuff. So they x-rayed the mummy and they could see that there were these things inside the mummy with them. And they thought it was like amulets or jewels, like you often find in a mummy but when they unwrapped the mummy, they actually found this poor little dead lizard who accidentally got mummified with the human mummy. Um, so what happens is when you wrap a mummy, you use resin, which is really sticky. And this poor little lizard crawled across the resin and got stuck and then just got mummified with it. So the previous turtles, those were the oldest in the collection that have actually been collected. This is the oldest thing I have in the collection by age because he's 4,000 years old, which is so cool. And if you go to the Met, you can actually see some of the other things found from this tomb. Um, so you can go and see there's all these model boats and you can see, you know, lots of cool things from Waz tomb. Well, this is Waz dead gecko. So my last uh, preparation type is called clearing and staining. And it's personally my favorite. So clearing and staining if, is a process. So all you can see on the left is a Cuban tree frog. And on the right is a picture of the same type of tree frog that I have turned see-through. I've dyed its bones red and I've dyed its cartilage blue. And I think they're just beautiful. So this is, um, this is a process. So you can see what the inside of the animal looks like without, um, you know, without it being dead. It's really cool. And this is a very old technique. Um, so this is what they did before they had x-rays and CT scans. And the thing about it is, is no one really does this much anymore because you can do a CT scan in a couple hours. And this process takes me almost a year to do. It takes almost a year to get it perfectly cleared and dyed and look this nice. So it's kind of outdated because no one wants to wait that long. But I'm, it's a, the cool thing you can do with clear and stained specimens, you can actually watch the bones grow. So like I said, uh, red is bone and blue is cartilage. So on, on this specimen, the one on the left is an alligator embryo. And the one on the right is an alligator embryo right before it hatches out of the egg. So you can see the literal, littler alligator is all blue. So he's all cartilage, no bones. But look, as he's getting ready to hatch, you can actually see how some of the bones have grown and you can see the red bones. And if you even wait until after it hatches and an adult crocodile, if you dyed it, it would be entirely red. Um, which is really cool. So you can do these um, these developmental series to watch the, the, the ossification process. Um, and we, I do that a little bit. You, you may have seen some of the exhibits, like the Dinosaurs Among Us exhibit. Um, they had some cool clear and stained specimens there that I actually did for the, um, for the exhibit. Um, so that's kind of a, a brief little bit about, um, about the types of specimens we have in the collection. But next you're gonna talk to a scientist who actually uses the collection. So this is Ariana Kuhn and she's one of our students that's getting her PhD utilizing the collections. And she does her work in Madagascar and snakes. And she's gonna tell you all about it. Thanks Lauren. So like Lauren mentioned, I'm a researcher and PhD candidate at the museum who works in Madagascar. So Madagascar is an island off the coast of East Africa and home to some of the most unique and bizarre animals on the planet Earth and also my favorite animals on the planet Earth. So my job is to travel to Madagascar to undersampled habitats and I am there to catch snakes. So what this really looks like is me flipping over lots of rocks and tree stumps during the day looking for animals that are hiding and then going out at night with headlamps looking for nocturnal species that are hunting. 
When I find a snake, I catch it with my bare hands. Um, there are no lethally venomous snakes on Madagascar, so that makes this a little bit easier. And I take a small tissue sample that I get DNA from back at the museum in our laboratory. And I can actually use the DNA of these snakes to learn about how they evolved and adapted to these really specialized habitats across Madagascar. Mm -hmm. Now I can also use their DNA to identify new species. So different species are gonna have minuscule differences across their genomes. And uh, when we document and describe these new species in threatened habitats, we can actually help understand and ultimately conserve these species in the future. So I also have a few collections favorites that I want to share with you as well. Um, so the first specimen I'm gonna be sharing with you is an Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake or Crotalus adamantius. So what I love about this specimen is you can see the viperid fangs in the front, which are hollow, just like a hypodermic needle. And they have a tiny hole near the tip that they can use to inject venom into prey items. So just like sharks shed and replace their teeth, so do rattlesnakes. You can actually see on this specimen that there's a new fang replacing an old fang, which is really cool to observe. My next top favorite specimen in the collection is the skull of this large adult green anaconda. So just for a size reference, this is as long as my hand, maybe a little bit longer at the quadrates. So Eunectus marinus is the largest species of snake in the world by weight. They can be up to 550 pounds. So that is a really big snake. Um, and I want you to check out the teeth on this snake. They have a row on the roof of their mouth and a row on the maxilla. So, and they have this really specialized recurved shape. So they don't use venom to subdue their prey like the rattlesnake, but they use constriction. And these special recurved fangs make sure that the animal can't escape while they're feeding. So um, now that I've shared some of the collection stuff that I really love about the museum, I want to share some of my quarantine buddies that I've been sheltering at place and home with me and tell you a little bit about them. So I'm going to pull out my first animal. So this first species of snake is something I think you probably have never seen before. An AB snake called Nicely Pelgonzi. So I'm going to show her to you here. So they are obligate egg eaters. So the only thing that the snake eats are tiny little bird eggs. So the snake feeds by stretching and wrapping its highly kinetic skull and jaws around an egg that is way, way bigger than her tiny head. So basically, like a human being swallowing a watermelon whole. So it almost looks like the snake might be choking. Um, and I'll show you some photos of this in a second. But instead, they twist their body around the uh, egg and use special bony processes that are sticking off the bottoms of their vertebrae to puncture the egg. And then they kick back and drain the yolk into their stomachs and actually barf the eggshells back up. So this is a highly specialized feeding mechanism for a snake. And they're never going to eat anything but eggs. Um, this species is typically very calm. Um, but a bite from an African eating, eating snake would be painless because they have no teeth in the front of their mouth, just gums. And to warn off predators, a species mimics a sauce, rubs their keeled scales around, just like we saw here, um, to make a really... She's not doing it right now, but that is the same snake. And I will mention that this egg-eating snake does not have a name yet, so please leave really fun, creative ideas for names in the comments below. I'd love to read them. Okay, I'm gonna put her back and bring out my next quarantine buddy. So this is a littler snake that I hope you guys will find really cute. This is my rough green snake, and his name is Gumby. So, um, <clears throat> Just like the African egg-eating snake, Gumby is a snake with a really specialized diet. So rough green snakes spend the majority of their time hunting for insects, spiders, and other invertebrates in the vegetation well above the ground. So they're quite docile. They almost never bite when encountered in the wild. And if you were supposed to, if you came across this animal in the forest, you'd probably freeze and use his green coloration and skinny body to blend into his surroundings. At night, they're found sleeping in little shrubs coiled up, and they can grow to be several feet long. So although Gumby's an adult, he's gonna get a lot bigger. And I just wanna show you guys, his tail starts right there. So that's all snake tail. And the reason they have these super long tails is not only to climb, but also it helps with circulation when they're climbing upwards against gravity. So this is Gumby the rough green snake. And now I think that Lauren is gonna share some of her quarantine buddies with you as well. Yeah, so Ariana's got some snakes, but I have a whole menagerie of amphibians in my apartment since they are definitely couldn't be left in the museum while we were, uh, while we had to work from home. Um, so I'm going to show you one of my frogs. 
So this is this is a really cool frog, and you've definitely probably seen one before. They're quite common. Um, so this is a red-eyed tree frog. And right now he's pretending to be a leaf. He's sleeping on the underside of a leaf and blending in nicely. And that's really great camouflage for living in the rainforest, especially because he's nocturnal. He only comes out at night. So during the day, he wants to be as hidden as possible. Now, the red-eyed tree frog has a, has a cool mechanism for hoping to scare off predators during the day. So they call it flash coloration. And he's all green right now, but when I wake him up, you're gonna see some very bright colors. So if he accidentally got woken up during the day by a predator, he would try to flash some of these colors to get away. So I'm gonna wake him up for you and you can see just how bright. Oh, <laughs> um, he just hopped. He's a very hoppy guy. Okay, so this is Zool, the red-eyed tree frog. Um, he's arboreal, which means he um, he lives in the trees and he definitely likes to jump uh, upward in case you can't tell as he's getting ready to aim for the camera. Um, so another cool thing about the red-eyed tree frogs is they, um, so they lay their eggs on the edges of leaves that overhang water. So when the eggs hatch, they will um, they will hatch into the water. Um, but something cool about them is there's a species of snake. <laughs> there's a species of snake that eats uh, that eats these eggs. And the, the way to combat that, these eggs have developed a really cool mechanism. If the eggs feel any vibrations from, say, a snake starting to eat them, the eggs will hatch almost whether they're ready or not. So they have these vibrational cues that will actually make the eggs hatch so they don't get eaten by a predator and they fall into the water and can escape. It's really cool. So that's one way that um, frogs have great, like almost parental uh, mechanisms. There's another cool frog that is called a pippa frog. It actually will lay its eggs under the skin of its back and the babies will grow in there and then hatch out of the mom's back skin. That's how she protects them. And one of my favorite frogs is a, called a, um, a gastric brooding frog and the mama frog will actually swallow her eggs and the babies will grow in her stomach and then when they're full grown far froglets, she'll barf them back up. Unfortunately, the gastric brooding frog is now extinct in the wild, so um, we, there's probably not going to be any more of them again. There's a cool project trying to clone them and bring them back called the Lazarus Project, but in the meantime, they're gone. So I hopefully got a good view of him. Um, he's really cool, and he's hopping away. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put him back in his in his enclosure since he's um, a hoppy little guy. But so that's Zool, the uh, the red eyed tree frog. <laughs> Um, I have another very, very special friend uh, here with me today. Um, his name is Small Wonder, and Small Wonder is my baby. So Small Wonder, is a yellow-lipped Parsons chameleon. Um, so Small Wonder has a very special story. You don't often see these animals. Um, and we actually have him because he was seized uh, by an illegal pet trade shipment. So someone was trying to bring him into the country illegally and to be sold into the pet trade. Uh, and he was confiscated. And that's how we ended up being able to take care of him is, um, you know, he wasn't, we can't bring him back to Madagascar, which is where he's from, unfortunately. So we take care of him at the museum. So he is a big chameleon. He is arguably the largest species species of chameleon in the world. Um, and he's very, very special. Chameleons have a lot of really cool adaptations. Um, as you can see, he's got these cool, I call them little mitten feet, but it's called zygodactylus feet. And he's got five fingers, um, but they're split up and he uses them to grip the tree branches just like this. Um, chameleons, they can change colors, but it's not like you think. You see in the cartoons that if you put a chameleon in front of a polka dot background, it turns polka dot or plaid. Chameleons can't do that. They don't really change color to their background like that. But he does use his color to communicate. Um, so when he gets a little grumpy, like he is right now with being handled, he gets these dark stripes. If he sees himself in a mirror thinking it's another male, he turns bright white with yellow stripes. Um, sometimes he gets these little purple polka dots, don't know what those mean. Um, and he can actually use the, um, the color changing to thermoregulate. So reptiles and amphibians are cold blooded. So what the temperature is outside is what they are. So if he's cold, he'll actually turn darker to absorb more light. And if he's too hot, he'll turn lighter to reflect the light off of him to cool down. And it's fun because when he sits in his window at work, the side facing the window is a different color than the side facing the room. So he can actually, you know, really, really control his color with these cool uh, pigments called chromatophores in his skin. 
Another cool thing about chameleons is they have 360 degree vision. So he can see all around him at all times. Um, and you can see him looking around now. And they use this and there we go. Um, so a cool thing to do with this vision is, I don't know if you know, but they have very long tongues. Their tongue can be twice the length of their body. And he actually uses his eyes to triangulate where his prey is and then stick out his tongue and grab it. Um, Oh, just like this. So here's a good picture of him eating his favorite snack, which is Madagascar hissing cockroaches. And that's his tongue hanging out of his body. Um, it's really cool. If there, if chameleon's tongues were cars, they could go from zero to 60 in one one hundredth of a second, which is crazy. Um, that's very fast. And chameleons come in all shapes and sizes. Um, so this is, this is one of the largest species. The smallest species of Brucasia can actually fit on the head of a match. That's how tiny they are. Little minuscule guys. Oh, look, hey, we have a picture of a, of a Brucasia. Uh, that's one Ariana took when she was in Madagascar. Um, so yeah, so he's, he's really cool. Um, and this is, this is my, uh, this is my baby, small wonder. Um, so I think we have some time now to answer some of your questions. Um, so let's see, let's get started. Um, Ariana, do you want to answer this one? Besides, uh, frogs, toads, and salamanders, what other types of our amphibians are there? So you got almost every single group there. There is one more that's missing. That's a really, really interesting um, group of amphibians, which are the cilians. So these are going to be organisms that also respire through their skin and they're going to have moist kind of glandular skin, but they're not going to have limbs. And so the reason they have no limbs is because they're burrowing um, beneath the ground, hunting and hanging out. And so you no longer need legs when that's your environment. So this is a really cool group and everyone should look them up because they're really interesting. Okay, I have a couple of collections questions. So um, I have a question about uh, fluid for preserving specimens. So are there any other fluids for preserving specimens? And there are, so you may have heard about, uh, there's lots of ways to preserve specimens. You know, if you're in a pinch, you can even throw an animal in a bottle of rum and it'll work if you're in the field. But what most scientists like to do is we actually, we call it fixing the animal and we'll put it in formaldehyde for a few days. And formaldehyde really stiffens the animals up and then we switch it to alcohol because long-term exposure to the formaldehyde can be bad for the specimen. And it can also degrade DNA. So someone like Ariana, who's trying to work with DNA in specimens, um, she actually likes them to be just preserved in alcohol so she can still get DNA from them. But most of the specimens are fixed in formaldehyde and then switched to alcohol for the collection. Um, okay, uh, we have another collections question. It's how old are the museum's oldest specimens? So obviously in paleontology where the dinosaurs are, they have very old specimens. But in my department, you've actually seen them. So the, the tortoise shells are the oldest uh, collected specimens I have that were collected in 1810. And um, they're actually from the, the museum's original uh, collection that they that they started the museum with um, called the Maximilian Collection. And the oldest specimen I have in my department by actual age is the mummy gecko. He's 4,000 years old. Um, oh, here's a good question. Uh, this is an Ariana question. Is there a common ancestor to reptiles and amphibians? Okay, so this is from Christian, and I think that's a fantastic question. And there is a common ancestor of amphibians and reptiles, but it is a very, very old common ancestor. So the common ancestor of reptiles and amphibians would be a tetrapod, meaning an organism that has four limbs, that's where the word tetra comes from, um, that is able to walk on land. And so this is a descendant of a sarcopterygian fish, and that's a very, very old ancestor, but that's what links these two groups together is having four limbs. Although animals like snakes have lost those four limbs, the ancestral state is to actually have four. So it's a fantastic question. Okay, um, our next question is from Cynthia and she wants to know how old Small Wonder is. So it's actually kind of hard to tell. We've had him for about five years, but Obviously, he when he was seized, he was full grown. So he was probably at least a couple years old uh, when he was uh, confiscated. So he may be as old as a decade. We're not sure. Um, and no one really knows how long chameleons live, but we're hoping to get a few more years out of him. Um, something like the small, I think it's the, the little guys, maybe the Brucasia, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Ariana. They only live a few months, right? 
species of chameleon that we actually uh, studied last time I was in the field. It's known as Furcifer labordi, and it is the shortest lived uh, vertebrate tetrapod on Earth. They're only alive four months after they hatch. So they spend most of their life actually as an egg. And Brukisi are in the same, same bucket, a uh, very, very short lifespan, somewhere close to that. Um, okay, let's see. This is a question from Anna. And what is the biggest snake? So Ariana talked about it a little bit, but the biggest snake by length is a reticulated python. Um, we have one in the collection that's 27 feet long, which is just huge. Um, and the biggest animal by or the biggest snake by weight is the anaconda. So anacondas are the fattest reticulated pythons are the longest. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, here's a question huh, from Dan. Is there a reason reptiles and amphibians are, are put together in herpetology? Aren't they pretty different? Yes, uh, they are pretty different. Um, so back in the day, they even threw fish in with a lot of museums still have the fish departments combined with the reptiles and amphibians. It's just how it's always been. Like mammals are distinct and birds are distinct and they're like, nah, everything else, we'll just put it over there. So that's why there's, in my opinion, there's not a great reason. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, here's a question for Ariana. Are there any cool research topics or conversations going on in herpetology about herp behavior? So that's a fantastic question. Um, herpetological behavior is actually a whole entire field within herpetology. So we can study behavioral evolution, so how these different traits evolve. We can also study it an, in an ecological setting, so how are these animals interacting with their environments. So there is a whole field of study that relates directly to this. Although I work more in um, evolutionary biology and genetics, there is absolutely an entire uh, field dedicated to this, and you can find a lot of publications in the literature through searching that deal directly with herpetological behavior. So um, I will have some of those posted to the final version of this when it gets saved for you to check out. Okay, we have a question from Audrey. Um, are there poisonous frogs in the tri-state area? So this is tricky. The important thing to know about this is the difference between poison and venom. So poisonous frogs, if you eat a poisonous frog, um, you'll die. And if you get bit by something venomous, you'll die, you know. Um, so there is nothing, um, there's nothing venomous in the tri-state area, but there are poisoned toads. Um, toads actually are, are poisonous in a lot of cases. Um, they have these big glands behind their eyes that excrete this, this, uh, this poison. It probably wouldn't affect you, but your dog may get sick if he eats it, may give him a tummy ache and stuff. So technically, yes, but nothing you have to worry about. Just anytime you handle any kind of wild animal, well, don't handle wild animals, but if you catch a frog, wash your hands well afterward and don't let your, your dog eat it. And while we're on the topic of poisonous amphibians, I know your question was about um, was about frogs, Audrey, but there are also toxic newts. And again, like Lauren said, these aren't going to be super toxic to us, but I certainly wouldn't put my hands in the mouth after after handling one. And this is known as the eastern red spotted newt. So you may have seen them on the forest floor. They're bright orange. They have bumpy skin and they're about this big and they are toxic as well. But super cute. <laughs> Um, so here's a good question from Andrew. Does the specimen's color get lost by preservation? Yes. Um, almost within a few months, the, the first pigment that gets pulled out is yellow. So you'll notice a lot of the jars are in yellow alcohol. It's not the alcohol. It's actually the yellow pigment has been pulled from the specimen. So you'll see a beautiful blue snake in a jar. It wasn't a blue snake. It was a green snake that lost its yellow pigment and looks blue in the jar now. So it's always important before something gets preserved to get a good a good photo of it so you can have a reference to what its color looked like. The pattern will still be there, but the color's gone. Um, especially with something like Small Wonder here, in the, the jars in the collection, he's just a brown lizard. Um, he looks really boring. So as soon as they, as soon as they get preserved, the color does start to go. All right, another question for Ariana from Steven. Can you get viable DNA from, oh, so, uh, can you get viable DNA from a specimen preserved in alcohol? 
That's a really important question, Stephen, because often we're faced with uh, an opportunity to get DNA from a specimen that's already been preserved that we might never find again in the wild or that is so rare to find in the wild. And recently, we've gotten better and better of actually extracting DNA from museum specimens that have been preserved in ethanol. So what happens when a tissue is in ethanol is that the integrity of the DNA becomes lost. So it begins to fragment and break up, and that makes it really difficult for us to sequence the DNA. However, um, using a couple of different modern techniques, we're actually able to piece these fragments together and we can extract uh, good DNA from ethanol specimens if we're very careful. Um, we have a lot of good questions about snakes for Ariana. <laughs> um, do, is there a relationship between American hognose snakes and the Madagascan species from Tim? That's a fantastic question. So yes, you may have noticed that there is an American species of hognose snake and there is a giant hognose snake in Madagascar. They even look somewhat similar in that they have these upturned noses, which is why we call them hognose snakes. This is a fantastic example of what we call two animals uh, kind of arrive at the same body plan, which were really well for a specific behavior that is actually not because they share a common ancestor. And that is the case with the hognose snakes. So their upturned noses are used to dig up eggs that have been buried in the substrate. And that's why they have this upturned nose, but they're not related to one another. So that's a fantastic observation. Okay, I have a question from Anna. Can you describe the clearing and staining process in more detail? Sure, it involves a lot of crying. Um, and a little bit of magic. So it's a whole series of chemicals and enzymes and dyes. So first you have a specimen and it, you have to preserve it and you need it to be as small as possible. The smaller the specimen, the better. Um, so usually if it's something a little bit bigger, I'll actually skin it and remove its guts just so there's less stuff to get in the way. But something small like an embryo, you don't have to do much with. Um, so the first thing you do is you actually do the blue dye and the blue dye is glacial acetic acid and a blue dye and that adheres to the, um, the cartilage. Uh, next you put it in this pancreatic enzyme called trypsin and borax, which is a degreaser. And it starts making the specimen all like gooey and kind of, it's really gross looking. Um, it, it looks like a weird mushroom soup. I haven't been able to eat mushrooms since I started this. Um, and so it makes it kind of like gooey and weird. And then you put it in the red dye, which is potassium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide adheres to the calcium in bones. That makes the bones red. And then you put it in a bath of a bleaching agent. So I use, um, hydrogen peroxide, potassium hydroxide, and glycerin, and it slowly bleaches the process. I put it in a bright, hot window. Uh, UV light really helps clear it out, and I keep doing this for about a year, and it takes almost a year for it to clear, and then the specimen is actually stored in glycerin, um, and the glycerin is cool because it has the same viscosity as the cleared specimen, so it looks even clearer um, in this thing of glycerin. Um, so that's a great question, and I do love doing it. It's just very time-consuming. Um, let's see, uh, from Noxie for Ariana, what should I do when I encounter a wild snake? This is, uh, an important question. So I would say that when you encounter a wild snake, uh, both to be safe is to leave it alone and observe it from a distance, which is one of the most interesting ways to observe snakes because you can see how they interact with their environment without the threat of a predator up close, freaking them out. Um, and the other reason I say this is because wild animals can become very stressed when handled and especially if handled improperly or something happens and they get dropped and a stressed out animal is less able to survive in the wild than one that has not been stressed out. So I would say to observe it um, from a safe distance and then let it be on its way is the best thing to do when you encounter a wild snake. You don't need to run away from the snake. It's not going to chase you, but um, uh, best to leave them be. Unless you're like us and then we jump on them so we can look at them closer. That might be what I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So we have another question. Um, does small wonder or any chameleons vocalize any sounds? For what purpose? Oh boy. They can hiss. Um, yeah. Wild chameleons are angry. Chameleons do not make good pets at all. You should never get a chameleon as a pet. They don't like to be handled really. Um, they, you know, they're, they get stressed out pretty easily because they're, they're a prey item. So they constantly think you might eat them. Um, small wonders because he's a bigger species is a little bit more calm than your average chameleon, but they're, they're not great. Um, but when you catch them in the wild, oh, they are angry. They gape their mouths open and they hiss very loudly. Um, mm -hmm. Ariana can tell you about that. There's, she has hilarious pictures from the field. 
of holding chameleons just with them screaming at her. Um, so yeah, definitely a defense me, mechanism. <laughs> what if you get bit by a snake? And my answer is, what if I get bit by a chameleon? Because <laughs> their teeth are much bigger and sharper and they are so much angrier. And if you think about it, for an animal that relies on crypsis and hiding in the trees, vocalizing might not be the best form of communication if you're trying to remain hidden. So they're, they're communicating with other cues that are not vocal in that sense. Um, so we have one more question from Glenn that we're going to answer, which is, are most lizards able to regrow their tails? So some of you that have had pet geckos may have seen this phenomena where the gecko actually drops off the end of its tail and scurries away to, to live another day, or your pet gecko now no longer has a tail. So many lizards can regenerate this tail. But the regenerated tail is a little bit different. The color will be different. It will not have bone. It will just be cartilage tissue. So it's a slightly different tail that does grow back. But most of them that drop their tails are able to regenerate all or part of this tail. And it's a fantastic way of escaping. I have had plenty of lizards I've tried to catch in the field that have dropped the tail and boozled me and away. So I can imagine that for um, a predator, it would work really well also. And then to add to that, something like the chameleon. So the chameleon can't do that. The chameleon has a really cool tail. It's actually, um, it almost is like a fifth arm. It's prehensile. And he can hold on to the leaves or to the branch of the trees with his tail. And his tail is just as strong as the rest of his body. I've seen him pull himself up by the tail. Um, and if you're trying to move him to get him to the vet or clean out his cage and stuff, yeah. he will hold on with his tail and it takes a second person to help you unwind it. It's very strong. Mm -hmm. So something like the chameleons, they don't drop their tail um, like some of the other species do. Okay, so I think that's all the time we have for questions, but we did compile the list of name suggestions for <laughs> Ariana's uh, egg eating snake. So let's see, we have omelet, which is great. We were thinking about omelet. Yeah, I like omelet. Um, huevo. Fantastic. Shelly. Shelly. Oh, we didn't think about Shelly. That's a good Shelly one. Shelly is too. funny. I like um, that. Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> uh, that is very creative. Ginny, Eggsy, and Agatha. Agatha. And I'll have to include Lauren's submissions in this group as well because she had a couple of creative ideas for the snake. Uh, uh, Christina Aguilera, obviously. <laughs> um, or Eggy Pop. <laughs> Yeah, we're, so these are really great, guys. Keep the keep the name suggestions coming in the comments, and I'll hopefully get to pick out a name for this snake in the next couple of days. Um, so unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have for today, but we had a great time. We love answering questions. Um, obviously, you can tell this is one of our favorite things to do, or we wouldn't have this job. Um, <laughs> so uh, thanks for joining in. The museum is doing these broadcasts every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern time on the AMNH YouTube channel. And next week, we'll have scientists talking about trilobites for all of you paleo lovers out there. So be sure to um, like and subscribe and join us next week. Thank you.